Um, it's a great pleasure to have Holly here uh, from Nike Life Schools. Uh, and he's going to talk about distribution of Hamilton Trackable Bamboo Acquisitions for continuous time reinforcement learning. Enjoy. Stay yeah. here. Well, uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm um, Harley. I'm a second year DHG student at uh, McGill University and Mila. Uh, and this is some work that I did with my supervisors, Dave Meager and Mark Belmar, uh, where we sort of developed um, the first sort of theory of distributional reinforcement learning for continuous time stochastic MVPs. Uh, so as an outline, uh, I'll start by talking a bit about uh, what we mean by continuous time reinforcement learning and the challenges that come with that, uh, and then a little bit of an overview of distributional reinforcement learning. Um, and then this, the, we'll then talk about sort of why it's actually non-trivial to, to combine these two settings uh, and uh, techniques in RL, um, and then move on to our what we call distributional HJB equations, which characterize the distribution over returns uh, that you would achieve from a policy in a continuous time stochastic MVP. And finally, we'll talk about how we can sort of attractively uh, represent and solve these equations with the computer. So imagine we have this um, beautiful uh, inverted pendulum cart pull system, uh, and we want to swing up the pendulum and balance it upright. Uh, and one concept that's not often discussed in RL is sort of how frequently we could observe the state of the environment um, and likewise, how frequently we could actually send a control signal to the system. So you can imagine if your control frequency is low enough, for example, uh, let's say this frequency omega, it might be actually impossible to balance the pendulum, right? Like in an extreme case, if you could only send an action every 10 seconds, um, you know, pretty naturally you shouldn't be able to control the pendulum. Um, so then you might demand a sort of like higher frequency controllers to, to sort of resolve this issue. Uh, and as you increase the frequency of your controller, you should expect that you should be able to get closer and closer to uh, having some control over the uh, pendulum until finally you might reach a fast enough frequency and you're able to balance the pendulum. Um, and at least if you're looking at just integer multiples of a given control frequency, you should expect that as you're getting higher and higher frequencies, you should expect more and more performance or at least non-decreasing performance. Um, and so we should, you know, be interested in studying uh, how RL works as you get higher and higher control frequencies. Uh, because actually, as the control frequency tends to infinity, um, the sort of characterization of the value function fundamentally changes. So as the, the control frequency tends to infinity, um, this is what's called continuous time setting. Um, and now, instead of having a Bellman equation that, uh, that governs the, the value function, we have what's called the HJB equation, which is a partial differential equation, um, which is now our characterization of the value function in this setting. Uh, but there's some um, important points to note about this equation uh, and some issues that we need to deal with in this setting that we would never really have to consider in discrete time. So first of all, um, this term mu pi over here, this is the sort of the derivative of the state in time uh, when you're following this policy pi. Uh, and already this sort of just like, it only really makes sense if you have the deterministic uh, dynamics uh, where you actually have this derivative of um, your state. So this equation actually only holds for deterministic dynamics. And we'll see that um, when you have uh, stochastic dynamics, you end up with a fundamentally different equation yet again. Um, but even in this like maybe simple deterministic case, uh, there's another very subtle point that, that causes uh, some headaches. Uh, and that is this gradient of the value function. Uh, which is implicitly assuming that this gradient actually exists. Um, and it's actually very easy to find MVPs that are actually fairly natural um, where this gradient would not exist, where basically the value function is not differentiable. So you might expect, well, we'll need to find a sort of weaker notion of solution to this PDE. Um, probably the most natural thing you could think of is, uh, well, rather than only like uh, allowing differentiable uh, value functions. Maybe we're okay with just satisfying the solution almost everywhere. So uh, we could search it on the space of uh, value functions that are, um, well, just um, differentiable almost everywhere. But this is actually too weak. Uh, and if you allow yourself to search among that space, uh, there's actually generally infinitely many solutions to this equation. And these solutions could be arbitrarily sort of bad and not representative of the actual value function. Uh, Fortunately, this problem has been studied for a very long time. And uh, I think in the 1980s, um, Crandall and Lyon 
uh, came up with this concept of what are called viscosity solutions to HJV equations. And this is a, a sort of complex uh, family of, of solutions to describe. But importantly, there's a to any HJV equation under some fairly mild assumptions, a unique viscosity solution, which happens to correspond to the, the value function. Uh, and numerical methods exist, uh, so we know how to how to compute viscosity solutions to HJV equations. But the, the point being is that this is not nearly as simple a problem as in the, the sort of discrete time uh, Bellman equation case, where you actually have to be really careful what the solution would be fine. Um, so now let's talk about what happens when you actually have noisy dynamics, because uh, if you've never seen uh, continuous time noisy dynamics, um, they're, they're kind of weird. Um, so this is an example um, where I have a, a sort of deterministic like sine wave in the lighter gray color, and then I'm perturbing that sine wave by uh, what's called a Brownian motion noise, which is a, a very simple form of continuous time noise where you can imagine um, for any two time points uh, separated, or any two states separated by, let's say, uh, like H units of time, um, the variance um, between those two is a normal, uh, an independent uh, normal with variance H. Um, and Brownian motion is also the, the, the paths are always uh, continuous. Um, so you could sort of, instead of have, I guess, like a variance H between uh, two points H in the future, uh, sorry, H time units apart from each other, you could slide a constant and get noisier uh, Brownian motion. And as we scale this noise, we get these paths that sort of veer further and further away from um, the nominal trajectory. Um, and in fact, these paths are, are so noisy, um, basically that, uh, oops, sorry. They're so noisy that they're actually not even differentiable anywhere. So the regular tools that we use in calculus um, can't even use them here. In fact, we have to, we have to resort to studying um, what's called stochastic calculus. Um, so in stochastic control theory, the sort of very, very famous model of noise that's essentially ubiquitous is that of uh, what's called an Edo diffusion, where the evolution of your state is taken to be uh, a sum of this deterministic uh, drift uh, mu pi, which would be equivalent to what you have in the uh, deterministic dynamics case, plus uh, this next um, noise process, uh, which is an integral with respect to this, this Brownian motion noise, and you could have this uh, this volatility term that's it's labeled sigma pi, where in the ERL case, this represents a sort of policy and state dependent um, noise as your, your agent um, tra tra traverses through space. Um, and as I was saying, Brownian motion is not differentiable, so you, you can't study these types of processes with sort of classical calculus techniques. Um, and one consequence of this is that even like a Taylor expansions and chain rules are fundamentally different. Uh, so the HJV equation, when you have these Edo diffusion dynamics, is now actually a second order equation. So it is already bad enough when you have one derivative of the value function. Uh, but now when you don't have determinist, uh, deterministic uh, dynamics, you have this second order. Uh, yeah. yeah, so just regarding uh, like how you're adding noise, so I would say that, okay, maybe this is widespread because people read a lot of calculus, and, uh, but is there a fundamental reason we should prefer the scaling of the noise that is prescribed by the Browning noise uh, when the time goes to uh, the, the time difference goes to zero? I mean, like, it's, it's a very particular way. Uh, of doing these things, and you can imagine different scalings that result in different kind of calculus, and yeah, like from a modeling perspective, what's the reason to, to use this particular way of doing things? Yeah, so I, I had this, a, a very similar question when I was starting this work, and yeah. it actually delayed me for quite a while because I was sort of disappointed. Because, yeah, you're right, it just looks like you're making a pretty specific uh, uh, modeling choice. Um, so it turns out that these processes are actually fairly, um, like they actually, so, so any martingale noise, there's this result where you could write basically any continuous time martingale as like some rescaling of time and grounding motion. Um, so they're like fairly, like, um, it, it's it's like, yeah. So there's a little that 
so if you have like a, uh, if the quadratic variation is t, so it's same like there's some conditions like if the quadratic variation is t and that kind of stuff, then it becomes automatically a brown motion shift. Sure. But that's the condition. Yeah. I'm asking why did you subtract to that? So because the integral, these integrals, uh, if uh, you go by Ito's way, so there's multiple way of uh, this defining stochastic integrals, right? Sure. So if you go by this way, it will become a modeling gate, that kind of stuff. So I do understand. It's still the modeling choice. So it could be I, yes, I, think I don't see the physical reality in this necessarily when it comes to running a robot. I, 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 my, uh, my solution will actually be more general than just uh, you know diffusion. Okay. So, uh, right. yeah, uh, I think this it just happens to be there's like many convenient uh, mathematical properties. Okay. The integrals are well understood, but uh, I will uh, do a you more general. Yeah. That's good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just to come on, there is a way to understand uh, the diffusion and the limit of joint processes. So you ensure that you have that uh, you interact with. Them. The frequency of the jam yeah. has to be connected with the grid and the variant of the noise. And depending on the scaling, there you have a tissue limit, and you still have noise in the limits. There you are in the grid limits, and the noise condition. So it depends on the variant scale in the proportional with the frequency or square root of the limit. You have different scaling that we need to different limits. So that's the way to explain what's happening in this pattern. I still don't understand that. I'm not sure that it answers my question. Um, yeah, I'm just concerned about that. You try to describe specific systems, and so yeah, there should be some explanation of why a certain way of taking limits is the way to go. I'm not sure what this. I guess maybe what happens is that, but well, maybe maybe we can take this offline. It's a good uh, discussion topic for some of the ones. I, th I think especially for yeah. real systems, also. I I think the noise would probably not actually be independent over time. Yeah, there are uh, lots of issues. Yeah. yeah, but then once you do that, then you no longer have like Markov, uh, Markov dynamics, and things get really ugly. Yeah, I'd like to discuss it. Um, so yeah, there there are also notions of the viscosity solution for these second order equations. So we, we still know how to solve these. Um, but yeah, all this was just to say that yeah, the, the situation turns out to be quite a bit more complicated and continues on. Uh, so now I'll talk a bit about distributional RL. Uh, so if you're not familiar with distributional RL, um, the, the whole idea is basically to move away from uh, studying the value function, that being the mapping from states to the expected uh, discounted return that you would accumulate uh, after following your policy from that state, and instead uh, try to estimate the probability distribution over the returns that you would uh, accumulate. Uh, and these probability distributions, by the way, are they're just representing the aleatoric uncertainty of the return and not uncertainty of the parameters, for example. Um, and there's many reasons why you might want to do this. Um, the most interesting one, in my opinion, at least, is uh, if you have these distributions over returns, then you could uh, make some, uh, you choose other heuristics to optimize this, uh, aside from the expected value uh, of your return, which a lot of the time I would argue is probably not the, the right heuristic. Um, but beyond that, uh, it's just been shown time and time again that when you use these, uh, you think of learning these return distributions uh, sort of like as auxiliary tasks. And then even if you're optimizing the mean return uh, in deep RL, especially uh, distributional reinforcement learning tends to increase performance by quite a bit. Um, so yeah, there's many reasons why you might want to learn return distributions. Uh, and that's a sort of orthogonal uh, concept to the continuous RL. Uh, so naturally, we might want to understand how we need these really fast, high-frequency controllers, how we can still estimate return distributions. And uh, until this work, this wasn't uh, studied. 
There's another problem when you're doing distribution LRL where um, unlike when you're modeling a value function, uh, it's actually not possible to represent the whole probability distribution in full generality. Uh, so you have to resort to um, sort of finite parameterizations of return distributions. Um, and there is this framework that was introduced by Mark Rowland uh, in 2019, where they described the problem as uh, essentially what you're going to learn is a set of statistics of your distributions. Uh, and then, you know, there, there's a theory that describes how um, uh, sort of a distributional Bellman operator, uh, how, how the return distribution is a fixed point of a distributional Bellman operator. So what you would do is take these statistics uh, for your return distributions, uh, use what they call an imputation strategy, which transforms these statistics into probability distributions, which you then um, do updates on with your distributional Bellman operator, and then extract the statistics back and store those in memory. And that's essentially how you uh, attractively uh, do distributional RL. Uh, and an interesting thing about this work that we'll see shortly is that the choice of the imputation strategy in continuous time actually has some pretty notable consequences. And this is not something that you would ever really consider in, uh, in the discrete time setting. Um, so the distributional Bellman equation, um, coming from the regular Bellman equation, it takes a pretty simple form. It basically says rather than uh, relating the value function at a given state to the expected value of the reward plus the discounted value of the next state, you just write it as well, these random variables are equal in distribution. Um, but equality in distribution is you know, very, very different from actual equality. Uh, you can't like do algebra like you normally would on an equation like this. So if you wanted an actual equal sign there, which you would use in uh, algorithms, for example, uh, you have this uh, actual distributional equality um, where eta uh, pi is the uh, what's called return distribution function, which takes states and uh, maps them to return distributions. Um, and over here in this, this expectation is, um, this is a really a mixture of probability distributions. Uh, it's not a, it's, it's not putting like a, a vector, it's, it's a mixture of distributions. Uh, and the way to read this equation uh, is you could think about it taking the return, like samples of the return distribution, for example, at the next state, um, and for each sample, computing R plus gamma of that sample and taking those sort of transformed samples and forming your uh, distribution uh, for the current state. Uh, I'll push forward and measure it. Um, and we see that this distributional Bellman equation is actually quite a bit different from the regular Bellman equation. Notably, it's not a linear equation anymore. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the operator that corresponds to uh, this equation, the operator's fixed point is the uh, return distribution function, um, is also uh, a contraction. Uh, in this case, it's a contraction in what uh, the, the operator calls the supremo Wasserstein metric which is basically if you take a supremum over the state space and uh, in that supremum, the, the Wasserstein distance between return distributions, um, this operator would be a, a contraction mapping. Where Wasserstein one? Or uh, I believe it holds for just Wasserstein P in general. Um, okay, so this is basically we convert this topology to We convert. Why weak convergence? But never mind. Okay. I think the Wasserstein one with many parties weak convergence. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, think I, I, I actually, yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that uh, that connection off the top of my head, but uh, um, yeah. So you could also, from some simple uh, arguments, you could show that um, this. Uh, topology is, um, is complete, uh, and so just by a regular but not fixed point theorem, uh, repeated application to the distributional Bellman operator will bring you to the fifth point. Um, so now what we want to do is sort of take this HJB equation and lift this from the space of uh, return, uh, sorry, value functions to the space of uh, return distribution functions. Uh, and it's really not immediately clear how to do this. Um, so notably, the HJV equation is not a recurrence. It's a, it's a PDE, so it doesn't relate 
return distribution, or, or at least value functions to other value functions that relate to value function to a differential of a value function. Um, and when you go to return distribution functions, look, your, your return distribution is no longer a form of vector space. So already gradients are a sort of odd, uh, odd issue to tackle. Um, and if we were, why not? Why? In what sense do they not? Probability distributions? Yeah. Well, you can't add them, you can't scale them. You, yeah. So, like uh, the unsigned measures make a vector space and not the probability distribution. Um, so, um, yeah, if we look at this equation, we try to figure out how the, the continuous time version would work. You see over here, we have this push forward measure on the next state return distribution. But when we no longer actually have a next state, you know, how do you do this push forward through like a differential? It's a sort of uh, uh, conundrum, I guess. Um, and so instead, um, what we're going to do is uh, use a really nice um, identity from the theory stochastic processes, which relate PDEs to sort of terminal uh, or conditional expectations of terminal values of certain stochastic processes. Um, so when I say stochastic process, very briefly, this is just referring to um, a sort of curve or like a trajectory in time of a random variable. Um, and the Markov property in continuous time is sort of very similar, uh, probably exactly what you would expect uh, from uh, discrete time, except now given there, there's no um, sort of discrete time steps, instead of having a fixed transition kernel, you have a, a family of transition kernels indexed by some time horizon H. Um, and these kernels can be seen as operators where um, applying uh, that kernel to the, the current state uh, tells you exactly the distribution over the state H units of time in the future, and you don't need uh, more information from the past. Um, and this family of transition kernels is actually, well, it's called the transition semi-group because um, these kernels form a semi-group by the mark property. You could show that if you have PS and PT, then the, uh, the composition of PS and PT is PS and PT. What's the meaning of the location of the age applied to x t here? Yeah, so this would be the integral. Um, this would be the integral. But it shouldn't it give you a random variable? If you're it doesn't give you a random variable. Okay, so, what, what is, yeah, so what's that? It's is it just following the age for or yeah. following the transition structure for each step? So yeah, exactly. I don't know where you put it to get. That's, that's what I have. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. So um, in order to use this nice identity that I, I've foreshadowed, um, you actually need a little bit more than just uh, the Markov uh, dynamics. Um, you need this uh, notion of the infinitesimal generator. Uh, and the infinitesimal generator exists basically when the expected value um, uh, of like the sort of difference uh, of the value of a function um, at a state h steps in the future for like infinitesimal h and your, your current value of the function um, sort of is uh, small enough so that this, this limit would exist. It's sort of the, I guess, equivalent of like a derivative of a stochastic process. So we're about that. Um, so the, the, the class of F, uh, generally it's like almost everywhere continuous functions, but it, it should hold for the, yeah, it, it's a sort of convoluted definition, what the actual domain of the generator is. Uh, it's basically just the set of functions where the limit exists. Um, but usually, um, people study the, the almost everywhere continuous, uh, functions. So X has some kind of well, or continuous. Sorry. So the, the argument X. Yeah. Oh, this would be like the state of the stochastic process. So we assume some topology here. Uh, yeah. So the we'll assume the the um the state space is like let's say like a Euclidean space, for example. So um. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when this infinitesimal generator exists, um, the, the process is called the feller dinkin process. Um, and the feller dinkin processes are a fairly, a fairly large class of processes, including the Edo diffusions, but also other types of stochastic processes. 
um, such as like jump diffusions, um, uh, a lot of like, new processes. Um, and so we're going to study basically how to characterize the return distribution function uh, for failure thinking processes in general. And um, we're going to use this identity here, uh, which was first found by Kolmogorov in the early 1900s, and then sort of uh, generalized by Richard Feynman and Mark Katz uh, simultaneously. Um, and what this identity is saying is that if we have a, a failure thinking process, x sub p, uh, as well as this um, this terminal uh, condition uh, characterized by its function psi, um, then the conditional expectation of the uh, psi evaluated at the terminal uh, x um, conditioned on the value of the, the state at time p. Uh, that conditional expectation solves this p, which uh, is written in terms of the infinitesimal generator of the uh, diffusion of the uh, elevation process. So, could you remind me what psi was? This is just this is just your boundary equation. Oh, so like, yeah, yeah. So um, one example. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm a bit confused. Is the Elliot operator giving us a random variable, or is it just? What's no, it's just a differential operator. It's uh, it's a determinant. Can you read the definition again? Okay. Yeah. So um, like the the the. L gives you functions. So. Yeah, right, exactly. So it's defined in terms of this expectation here, right? So it's like yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, there should. Yeah, what's wrong with there? Uh, this, this shouldn't be random. Okay, so the expectation is not made here. It is PH applies to FX. PH has from P. No, no, PH is the transition of characters to H carry the black of F. You have a unit of X that gives you a value. You subtract that. That's great. No, but even if you have PH to A, it is Yeah, it's the, yeah. the net A. Oh, because we define PH to be the run of yeah, the yeah, yeah. rather than the usual yeah. kernel operator. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's like a mean continuity of the pH difference. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, does, does that answer the question? Like, does that answer the question? We need semantics must change the previous line to give you some random thing. So you take the expectation, then you get back the video of pH semantics. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Basically, this is what happened. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. So, can um, this be exactly defined just as mean continuity? Um, well, it's not continuity, it's more like differentiability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. mean differentiability. Yeah. Okay. Also, what, so if this is a function from what to what? Uh, F could be it's just a function on the state space to also the yeah, to the reals. Let's say, yeah, state the reals, yeah. Uh, I mean, I believe F could also just be a function to some vector space, space, but, but you, yeah, you think you won't need that, right? Yeah, right, you're applying it to a function that has reals, yeah, so U is taking the reals, right. Or yeah. yeah. Could you let us start this? Sorry? Next slide. Next slide. Can we just start this for 30 seconds, please? Yeah. And so, so read it backwards. So the U, you find at the end, essentially so takes away up side and then extend back there oh, in time. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the original name for this was the Kolmogorov backward PDD. Exactly. Like, like you're saying, you have the, the terminal condition. Uh, yeah. Do you have a condition on the side? Or? Uh, I, I believe the leak continuous almost everywhere, I believe, is good enough. Uh, I don't remember the exact uh, regularity condition. I think the new. What was the question? 
uh, like regularity of size. Also, I, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming sort of, uh, usually I'm assuming that the state space is going to be bounded. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, if you have like an unbounded state space, then maybe you do need this extra uh, condition. Um, this involves the expectation just to be bad in the state, but yeah. Yeah. Growing yeah. condition to break expectation. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so just the, as a, a very simple illustrative example of how this uh, identity is used, um, this equation over here is the heat equation, uh, where the, the delta represents the Laplacian operator, which uh, Laplacian is the, the divergence of the gradient. Um, and so you could just rewrite this equation in the form of the before, uh, where right now the, the L would take the form of a negative Laplacian. And the relevance here is that the negative Laplacian operator turns out to be exactly the infinitesimal generator of Brownian motion. Um, and so the idea is that um, uh, to solve the heat equation, or at least to approximately solve the heat equation, you could essentially just do Monte Carlo uh, trajectories of Brownian motion. Um, this diagram is sort of exploiting the time reversibility property of Brownian motion, which lets you sort of replace the terminal uh, emission with an initial emission. And so these are just uh, samples of Brownian motion and it demonstrates sort of how the heat would uh, uh, disperse over time. Um, so our idea moving forward is we're going to try to find uh, a feller dinkin process uh, x sub t and this terminal function psi uh, so that the corresponding function u will in some sense encode the return distribution function. Um, and then given that, we will have a PDE that uh, characterizes how the return distribution function uh, evolves sort of over space and time. Uh, and the way that we're gonna do this is to start with this sort of weird process that I call the truncated return process. Um, and this process is taken by uh, looking at the discounted returns that you accumulate up to some time t. Uh, so this G bar of t would be really the, the this kind of returns that you get up to time t. And actually the, the truncated return process itself is gonna be defined as the joint process between this process g bar uh, and the state process xt. Um, and the reason why this is useful is because uh, at some like terminal like stopping time, for example, maybe you could define a stopping time in terms of um, when the, the agent state uh, leaves some region and that's when the episode ends, for example. Um, at this terminal time, uh, this G bar of T would actually represent the entire return that you, that you achieved over the course of your trajectory. Um, and so if we use this to be the indicator that uh, G bar is less than some value Z, um, then you get that uh, our function U is the probability that our total return uh, is less than Z. And this sort of looks like the cumulative distribution function of uh, the, the random return. Um, which is a signal that maybe this is a, a fellow, uh, this is a process that might actually tell us how to characterize the return distribution function. Good question. Yeah. What is this R of X test? Oh, that's the reward function. It's a function. Yeah, yeah, right. There's no noise. Anything. Yeah, so uh, you could extend this to uh, noisy reward functions uh, without too much trouble, but noisy reward functions in, in continuous time are also kind of weird. Um, so you could the space space yeah, that too. Component, and then you yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there a question? Yeah. 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 Okay. So this is basically the proposal is that you would have sort of one equation for each z kind of. Okay. So. Uh, we could show that this joint process uh, x sub t and uh, g bar is a feller dinkin process, and consequently we could find the uh, infinitesimal generator of that process, which is written over here, uh, where this Lx operator would be the infinitesimal generator of the state process as you follow the policy pi. Um, and so then by that uh, Kolmogorov backward PDE, uh, you get the following equation, which looks like maybe this is exactly what we want. 
Um, but actually, it's, 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 it's sort of close to what we're looking for, but not exactly, because um, these probability distributions here, like CDFs, I guess, um, are, are uh, CDFs of the return, but conditioned on uh, the state at some like intermediate time and all the, the return that you would have accumulated up to that time as well. And that's not really what we want. We want um, what is the distribution over returns that we would get if we started at a given state um, and we, you know, we don't worry about any of the report being accumulated up to then if you start at a given state, what distribution of returns that we get uh, in the future. Um, this, for example, is not time homogeneous. Um, you know, there's many reasons why this isn't actually the return distribution that we're that we're interested in. Um, but fortunately, it, it's not too difficult to transform that into uh, exactly a, a characterization of the return distribution. Yeah. Conditioning on the return. So far, does it actually impact anything? You have a state somehow. Um, why? Well, what's the implication? I, I assume the answer is yes, it does. But yeah, because the, this like return over here is returned for the full trajectory. So, oh. ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. You, you need to subtract that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, yeah, basically exactly. That's what you need. Yeah, but basically subtract it and do this, you know, divide by the discount factor. Um, yeah. Uh, so, this equation is actually not entirely precise because there should be some quality and distribution. Um, but uh, just for the purpose of intuition, uh, this is how we define this sort of transformed process, um, which we call a conditional backward return process, uh, where basically what we're doing is we're taking uh, this z pi of x naught, which would be the return that you get over the course of an entire trajectory, and we're conditioning on that return being this value z. Um, and so for each of these z, you get this, this process, which is defined by uh, like Chava said exactly, you subtract the return that you already accumulated divided by this uh, discount. Um, and uh, this is what we call the conditional backward return. Um, and so this process we also show is the failure to process. Uh, but I guess more interestingly, um, we show that uh, when you apply the infinitesimal generator of um, this failure to process, it is basically the, the um, annihilation and operator of the CDF of the return distribution function. And so this is actually the characterization of return distribution functions for general failure dinking processes. Or at least it's almost there because this LJ operator is sort of opaque. Uh, we could expand that a little bit. Um, and this is the more clear, uh, what we call distributional HJB equation for failure dinking processes. Uh, so it bears like a, a little bit of resemblance to the standard HJB equation. Um, but now instead of uh, having a, an equation on, on one variable, that being the state, uh, we have this equation on uh, well, the state and uh, the return that we're uh, like the, to the CDF. Um, and we have an extra differential uh, for the, uh, you know, this second term over here. And so this equation is um, actually, uh, this holds in, uh, in the sense of distributions. Um, where distributions is a sort of unfortunate uh, uh, naming collision where this is, I'm referring to distributions in the sense of like generalized functions here. Um, so it's basically saying that you could evolve uh, each side with like arbitrarily small um, uh, mollifying kernels, basically, um, the equation still holds. Yeah. So, two questions. So, do we also know whether uh, if you solve this equation, let's say this particular or whatever, I don't know how, uh, you get back uh, what you wanted. So, um, so, so far as you were talking about that, what well, this F, like this, this like the return distribution for this kind of process satisfies this equation, but the, the reverse question, yeah. if you solve this equation, do we get back the, the thing we wanted? And then previously you explained that you have to be careful with this. So yeah. I expect some things to yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah, so in, in general, no, but we're going to get to that uh, okay. shortly under some circumstances and prioritization. Maybe I just asked the other question, yeah. which is that uh, for the HGB, uh, you're arguing that 
for the third order motion, please if you skip your calculus, you have a second order plan. I don't see a second order plan. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised. Should I be surprised? Yeah, yeah. The, the second order term is getting in this um the, this lx operator oh, there yeah, which is, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and so actually right. the next one if you specialize this to ego diffusions uh you have your second order term uh, which looks a lot like the, the HGV equation. I'm feeding you on that. <laughs> um okay but now you, you, even if you wanted to try to solve these equations Basically, you know, the viscosity solution and all that, it leads to the least of your concerns because you can't even represent this equation on here, right? Um, so we have to resort, uh, resort back to these um, statistical functionals and imputation strategies to approximate um, return distributions. So um, basically, when you w once you plug in these sort of uh, fixed parameterization uh, distributions into the HJB equation, you know, the distributional HJB equation, um, the differential operators, uh, uh, when you pass these through your imputation strategy, cause these extra terms to sort of pop out. Um, in particular, these two terms that are labeled K, uh, K sub five, uh, K sub phi X and K sub phi S. Um, these terms are what I call the, the spatial and statistical diffusivity terms of the random return that are due to the choice of the imputation strategy phi. Um, and they could be pretty ugly. So the actual expression for these terms is, is given over here. And th this is also specific to the, the Edo diffusion case because they depend on, on the, uh, the generator of the state process, basically. Uh, but you could derive similar terms if you have infinitesimal generators uh, for other state processes. Um, and so the question is basically, uh, are there certain imputation strategies that we could that we could choose that somehow simplify these uh, and give us equations that are in some sense easier to solve? And do we even want to do that? Um, and the answer, at least to the first question, is yes. So um, the the statistics and imputation strategy on the top that I've drawn here uh, are what we call the quantile imputation strategy. Uh, the statistics are interpreted as the support of um, an empirical distribution. And it's called the quantile imputation strategy because if they're, they're ordered, um, then they actually correspond to the quantiles of that distribution. Um, and under that imputation strategy, the, the statistical and spatial diffusivity, uh, sorry, the statistical diffusivity vanishes completely. The spatial diffusivity term uh, simplifies a little bit as well. Um, and that results in some, uh, a much simpler equation. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, on the bottom, we have the, the categorical imputation strategy, which interprets its statistics to be uh, probability masses on sort of fixed bins in the space of returns. Uh, the the uh, statistical diffusivity and the spatial diffusivity are, are really nasty. Uh, and so the equations just get even more complicated. Um, so if we look at just the quantile imputation strategy, um, the distributional HJD equation actually reduces to the system of equations over here. And what's really nice about this system of equations is that it is actually a system of HJD equations. Um, so you have basically one HJD equation for quantile layer modeling, um, and then you would use this quantile regression. Uh, basically, it comes in the form of the, the boundary condition for these equations. Um, and so we could actually so we know how to solve the HJD equation. Um, and so we could actually use um, dynamic programming algorithms uh, for continuous time uh, RL uh, to perform what they call distributional dynamic programming. Yeah. What's, what's the size of X? It's in, is it read, read by a or Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, if, uh, yeah it, it's hard to scale this up to large, uh, to large states, basically. Yeah. I actually have a great question, but it's going the other direction. Yeah. So at one point, we arbitrarily said that the space is going to be a subset, maybe yeah. compact or whatnot, yeah. uh, maybe collected, blah, 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 like up the unit of space. But why not do everything in a discrete set? And then if we do that, I suppose everything pretty much goes through. The only question is, what are these differential operators? Are yeah. there difference operators then? Yeah, so if your state space is discrete. Um, yeah, it's like, that's a very nice continuous space. 
Yeah, I, honestly, I actually have no idea. Like I'm, I'm not sure. If, yeah, I, that's a good like, question. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, so, uh, essentially, what happens here is that the uh, generally Markov processes like SDs are associated with something called as uh, the, these generators are exactly the same as the generators in the martingale problem, you see. So the martingale problem characterizes the weak solution of these SGs, which right. are exactly these things. Yeah. And in discrete space settings, for example, mm -hmm. if you have Poisson processes, instead of, instead of uh, like these, those are also living processes. Yeah. So they can generalize the SGs to living yeah. processes. So for example, like in Poisson situations, you have, in fact, this difference operators. These operators become the difference operators. Right. So for so if you have like jumps in your noise, then it becomes uh, like a difference term in discrete space settings. Oh, right. So and in a but okay. So my my the interesting case for me is uh, you have Brownian uh, so Brownian noise uh, and discrete state space. Oh, we still get well like, you can't, can't really have brown oh you mean you mean discrete state spaces in like you actually have a, a continuous space but you're using the discrete topology or yeah i'm not no no that's it becomes random then it becomes a similar yeah. random walk kind of thing i'm okay with that i just yeah. want to know how the application supply yeah you can you can uh, then it becomes a difference thing difference uh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. Can, so this one you can approximate a problem option right you can approximate it with respect to continuous time and if because like fast yeah. jumps can also approximate yeah fast oh jumps. i see so that there is an x field is a continuous time process but it needs to jump between yeah. the yeah. discrete state yes yeah. right yes so you can approximate problem machine using that as well instead of instead of just jumping uh in specific times you can jump fast like yeah. an exponential times yeah. in this space. Yeah. yeah, I think this yeah. is what I was describing before yeah. as well. Like, if you have a speed space and you are doing stuff on discrete space, right. then your the DBT term that you had in uh, SDs, it would become something like a, a some jump term, D and those are like D and T terms. So the thing you think is better, uh, I think that would still hold it. No, I'm like, it will really remove a lot of stochastic processes. Then. It does. It does. Yeah. It does. So you can, in fact, study stochastic processes just from the process. Yeah. So just from the generators. But those, sure. those it's a very you, special class. But it gives you weak solutions. Uh -huh. uh, like they're distributionally same. But the finite dimensional distributions may not be. So you might not be able to study the strong solutions of these processes, but you can still study the weak solutions of these processes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I'm just clear about the differential distribution of a single policy, yeah. is the problem mostly equal to squeeze my one of my that just comes up here and I can try to do um, well, well, uh, so I mean, if you have a discrete time, uh, um, like if I just care about the distribution of that time, then I'll see. Yeah. Then isn't it a space if I just consider not the time, what a time, yeah. I just consider time one time two, and then what will happen? You're saying if you just have, you just care about the return distribution at the initial state, maybe? Well, this holds for all of the entire state space. So, yeah, 
But yeah, so but in, in discrete time models though, between individual time steps, the right. model is that nothing is really happening. Right. I mean, should I just have an equivalent a capitalization on the written distribution for this quite discrete time? When I consider this discrete time? Uh, I mean, I guess no, because I mean, even that, that isn't true, even if you're just looking at the expectation of the return, right? Um, like, even if you just have the, if you're modeling the value function, um, the, the characterization of the value function in continuous time. Is also it's not the Bellman equation, right? Because you have the, these dynamics that are causing um, sort of very specific uh, like uh, evolution. You have the cumulative um, sum of the cumulative towards for the time period, right? For this interval of time. Yes. Uh, so you're kind of saying it's, it's not going to be the equivalent if, if I consider the big oh, I it shouldn't be good because you could also like uh, I mean you have to be able to sort of control how far apart these individual time points uh, so are. So you're saying like if you're if you have this continuous process, but you're only sort of like looking at it at a yeah. fixed. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you can't really care about the return from the starting state. And right. The, the really a recursion. So yeah. So it, it is still a recursion. So yeah, I guess if you only cared about, I mean, yeah, at that point you could also, uh, yeah. I guess though, like, how are you? You're saying, but how do you choose these initial points? If you want to understand how your how to control the policy at any given point in time. In that case, uh, so if I just look at the process at some uh, interval. Yeah. Then do I get a uh, uh, discrete time? Right? Yeah. The time description of the same. And if I just care about the return distribution, can I just put a stack to then I can use a discrete for the value of the return distribution? Um, I guess that's the trouble with that also is that so you're saying you would take uh, basically the integral of rewards that you would achieve between your points and, and do that recursion. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I have to think about it. Um, um, but I mean, I think you're also like, but I mean, then you're also resorting to saying, well, we're only going to be able to take action at this discrete, these discrete time intervals, uh, which is. That's just for to fix the policy. Why if you have a single station on the first time, you want to calculate the distribution for it? I just didn't see why I cannot do it this way. So I don't know uh, in general why you want to find the optimal policy. I don't know how to solve this. Um, okay, maybe we can talk about it offline. I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure I understand the question, but um, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Sorry, I, I'll, I'll, I could uh, talk about it offline. Um, anyway, yeah, I, mean, I, I almost, uh, almost finished. Anyway, uh, we could, we could demonstrate uh, by this very simple example that uh, solving the distributional HIV equation 
actually computes the, the more correct uh, return distribution functions than if you were to use uh, sort of discrete time, uh, like distributional like TD learning algorithms. Uh, so this is just very a simple toy example that's uh, yeah. just uh, inspired by uh, this problem that was suggested by Remy Munoz uh, for demonstrating how um, discrete time RL algorithms can fail to an evaluation uh, uh, continuous time NDPs. So we have this particle in interval 0, 1, uh, and the, the sort of derivative of its state is uh, equivalent exactly to the action that's input uh, and the action is between minus 1 and 1. And when it reaches the end of the interval, um, when it reaches the state 1, for example, it, it receives a reward sampled from this Gaussian uh, of mean 2. Uh, and when it gets to state 0, it would receive a reward of 1 uh, sampled from a, a Gaussian uh, with mean 1 and mean. Um, and in the deterministic case with like deterministic rewards as well, um, you end up seeing that uh, discrete time RL algorithms tend to learn an incorrect value function that has like a, usually a sort of jump that occurs near the point of non-differentiability of the value function. Whereas when you use a uh, viscosity solution inspired techniques to solve for the value function, you're able to correctly learn it. And we show that basically the same behavior happens here with return distributions. So this is just an example of what the return distribution function should look like. And you note like around 0.2 or so, you have this sharp edge in the uh, in the contours of the return distribution function. Um, and if you just apply a uh, discrete time uh, quantile TD learning algorithm, uh, you have this very similar behavior to what you see in the expected value RL case uh, on, on this problem where you have this jump uh, and the whole probability mass sort of collapses in the middle of the state space. Um, but when you're solving the distributional HJV equation, you get a much nicer form that is actually at least accurately capturing uh, like the, the center of the, the uh, return distribution and it's maintaining uh, much better the actual probability mass. Uh, it's still not perfect. It still does lose some uh, probability mass or some variance, I should say, uh, towards the center. This is actually sort of uh, widely reported in distributional RL when you use these quantile representations, they tend to have trouble maintaining the, the variance. Uh, and perhaps this has to do with the, uh, this is related to the fact that the statistical diffusivity of these uh, imputation strategies is zero. Um, you think that maybe this is an indication of why uh, quantile functions uh, tend to uh, have trouble capturing variance. But nonetheless, um, solving the distributional HJB equation in this problem uh, does a much better job of solving the problem than the discrete time uh, quantile to be working on. And that's all. Thank you so much for uh, for sticking around. <laughs> Thanks for answering your very naive questions, very patient. <laughs> they were naive. <laughs>